right, so let's go ahead and begin with prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And let's pray in our Father together, thanking God our Father for his wonderful blessings, especially the, the blessing of salvation that he has given to us through his Son, Jesus Christ, and the blessing of the church that Jesus has given to us to be the voice of God on this earth, to guide and lead us into the truth so that we can obtain the freedom that Jesus desires for us to have, that freedom in the truth, that freedom in him, in Christ. And so we pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. All you holy apostles in heaven, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Okay, so here we are in lesson four of our seminar, the Narratio, a historical survey of salvation history from Genesis to Jesus. Uh, tonight's particular lesson is entitled the Abrahamic Covenant and the period of the patriarchs. We are coming out of the first period of salvation history, namely the early world. We looked at uh, two covenants so far within the framework of salvation history. We looked at the Adamic covenant, the covenant that God makes with Adam and Eve, with the human family and with all of creation. We looked at the Noachic covenant, that is the covenant that God has made with Noah. Tonight's lesson, we move into the third major covenant of salvation history, and that is the covenant with Abraham. And it also, we make the transition into the second period of salvation history, the period of the patriarchs. And so just by way of uh, introduction and an outline to show you the major sections of tonight's teaching, uh, first of all, I'll make a few introductory notes about Abraham uh, that sort of le serves to be a segue into the Abraham covenant. We're going to look at the three major promises that God makes to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, with, which is the essential foundation for the chosen people, the Israelites, and all of salvation history, really. And then we're going to take a look at an encounter that Abraham has with this mysterious figure known as Melchizedek in Genesis chapter 14. Uh, it's an event within the narrative story story within the narrative that's worthy of reflection and worthy of highlight. And then we're going to look at the three promises and how they're elevated to the status of a covenant in Genesis chapter 15, Genesis chapter 17, Genesis chapter 22. So in Genesis 12, God makes three promises, but each of those promises are elevated to a status of a covenant in the succeeding chapters. And so we're going to look at those covenant events and draw out a few details and look at their significance. And then we're going to take a look at the story of the patriarchs patriarch Jacob, because recall this is the period of the patriarchs, the first being Abraham, and then Isaac, and then Jacob, right? So we're going to look at the story of Jacob in particular tonight, and we're also going to look at the story of Joseph, one of the sons of Jacob. And that brings us to the end of the book of Genesis, finally with the covenantal blessing of Judah, uh, which also is one of the sons of Jacob whose name is changed into Israel. So we're picking up, we left off with, re recall the Tower of Babel, right? And the dispersion of the human family through the diverse tongues. And we left off by stating how the solution to that problem will come through Abraham and the covenant with Abraham. So we're going to take a look at that tonight. And we're going to go from Genesis 12 all the way to Genesis 50. We're going to cover the rest of the book of Genesis tonight. Okay, so y'all ready? All right, so let's strap on our seatbelts and let's go. Uh, just a few introductory notes. 
about Abraham. First of all, as I mentioned already, uh, this is the second, excuse me, the third major covenant within the framework of salvation history, and it's the second period of salvation history. Recall at the first lesson we said that there were, there were 12 periods of salvation history, and within that story of the 12 periods of salvation history, there are six major covenants. Well, we're in the second major period of salvation history, the period of the patriarchs. And we're in the third major covenant, that is the covenant with Abraham. And so this period of the patriarchs, you have the story of Abraham, Ishmael, and Isaac in Genesis chapter 12 on to chapter 25 verse 18 as you see on your handout. This period of the patriarchs, the sort of the second stage is the story of Isaac and then his sons uh, Esau and Jacob there in Genesis chapter 25 verse 19 all the way to chapter 36 verse 43. And then you have the story of Jacob and his 12 sons and their tribes in Genesis chapter 37 to 50 and how they end up in Egypt, right? And we're going to look at Joseph who's uh, put into a position that's second in command to none except King Pharaoh himself. And we'll be concluding with that story tonight. So the period of the patriarchs can be kind of sort of divided into these three major sections that you see here on the PowerPoint and on your handout. The second thing as an introductory note about Abraham is that he is of the righteous line of Shem. Notice how where we left off was with the Tower of Babel, right? And who was leading that project? Who was the project manager of the Tower of Babel? Nimrod, right? And remember Nimrod was a descendant of whom? Ham, the wicked line, right? Because Ham had sinned against Noah and committed the sin of what? Incest, right? And sleeping with his mother, his son, Canaan was cursed, etc. Well, Nimrod is a descendant of Ham. And so we leave off with that story with the Tower of Babel and then the narrative immediately shifts to Abraham, a descendant of Shem who was the righteous son of Noah in contrast to Ham. And we, we, we know this in Genesis chapter 14 verse 3. We read that Abraham was a Hebrew. Well, Abram in this case because his name's not Abraham yet. So I'll refer to him as Abram. But the clue is that he's a Hebrew. Now how does that reveal to us that he's a descendant of Shem? Well, the term Hebrew comes from Ibera, which was a son of Shem. And you can check that out in Genesis chapter 10, verse 21. The term Hebrew comes from one of the sons of Shem, whose name was Ibera. Okay? And so Abraham is a Hebrew. That is, he's a descendant of Ibera, son of Shem. So Abraham is of the righteous line of Shem. So we see how the author author is zeroing in, right, on the line that is in covenantal relationship with God. In the past, we saw that it was Seth on to Noah, right? And then Shem receiving the blessing of Noah and the covenantal relationship with God going through Shem. And now we come to Abraham. Once again, we're tracing the lineage. We're trying to follow the seed of the woman, right? That seed prophesied about that would crush the head of the serpent. The author of Genesis is showing the bloodline of that seed that will come and bring about victory. So in this case, we're looking at Abraham. So let's move to the three major promises that God re, uh, makes to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, which serves to be the not the beginning, but a point in salvation history where God is revealing his plan of sheer goodness a little bit more. Remember in Genesis 3.15, he already gave us a glimpse of his plan of salvation. The woman, the seed of the woman, crushing the head of the serpent, etc. He gave us a glimpse of his plan of salvation with Noah and the flood and the new creation. But Noah messed things up. His sons messed things up. There's a fall of that new creation. And then now we come to Abraham where God is going to reveal 
little more. So here's what we read in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, 1 through 3 quote, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Which, by the way, Abram didn't know what that land was. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who curses you I will curse. And by you all the families of the earth shall bless themselves. End quote. Now, just as a, an aside here, as a footnote, you might say, um, the scholars point out that this is kind of a weak translation in saying that the families of the earth will bless themselves as if they're doing the action. In the original text, it's passive. So a better translation would be, all the families of the earth will be blessed, will receive a blessing rather than blessing themselves. Okay? Now, that's important. And I'll, show, I'll point that out to you in a few moments. So, what are the three promises here that we can extract from this passage? Well, number one, first of all, the descendants of Abraham would be a nation with land. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred, your father's house, to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. That's the first promise. Nation, you're going to be a nation, Abraham. Your descendants will be a nation and possess a land. The second promise, that Abraham would have a great name. From what scholars say, that's a Hebrew idiom for a dynastic kingdom. Abraham will have a dynasty. Kings will come from him. Okay? And the clue being, God will make a great name for him. And then the third promise, Abraham will be a source of blessing for all the families of the earth. And thus, his descendants would consist of all nations. So we have these three promises. Nation and land. Abraham, your descendants will be a nation with land. Secondly, Abraham, your descendants will be a kingdom. Kings will come from your lineage. You will have a dynasty. And then thirdly, you, Abraham, and through your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And your descendants will be as numerous as the stars, right? Will consist of all nations. This sort of universal blessing of the whole world through Abraham. So these are the three promises. Now what's interesting is that scholars point out is that each of these three promises are actually elevated to the status of a sacred oath, a covenant, in the succeeding chapters. And so the first promise of nation and land is elevated to the status of a covenant in Genesis chapter 15 when we read about the story of Abraham, Abram, I should say, falling into a deep sleep. And we're going to look at that in a few moments in that covenant event. But this is where the first promise is being covenanted, so to speak. God made a promise in Genesis 12, but he's making a sacred oath in Genesis 15. And we're going to look at the covenantal feature present there. The second promise of a dynastic kingdom is covenanted, so to speak, elevated to the level of a covenant in Genesis chapter 17 where we read about the story of God commanding Abraham to circumcise himself and his family members, right? <laughs> Those of his, descend his descendants. <laughs> and then the third promise of universal blessing is elevated to the stat status of a covenant in the story of the offering of Isaac. The Jews call it the Akedah, that is the binding of Isaac. We as Christians refer to it as the sacrifice of Isaac. And we'll look at a few details about that later on tonight. But we see that the third promise of universal blessing is elevated to the status of a sacred oath or a covenant in Genesis chapter 22, where we read about that story. And so we'll go into more detail, but I just want to show you by way of review so you can kind of see the structure of the three promises and where they're elevated to the sacred oath and a covenant. Now, the next thing to note about the three promises that God is making to Abraham is their economic significance. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, remember, recall, economy of salvation. Remember that terminology? I pointed that out to you in our first lesson. Economy comes from the Greek word oikonomia, 
which is oikos, household, nomos, which is the Greek word for law or plan. So it's a household law or household plan. The early Christians used this term to describe God's actions in relation to his creation. So whenever God works in the history of mankind, the early Christians called that the oikonomia, the economy of salvation. It's the Father working out, exercising, uh, governing his household plan, right? Well, putting into effect his household law, his household rule, his plan of salvation. All right, so what's the first economic significance? As I mentioned at the outset, the three promises serve to be the solution to the problem that took place at the Tower of Babel. And our first clue is that Genesis 12, in which we have the three promises, follows Genesis 11, right? What happened in Genesis 11? It's the Tower of Babel. And so in Genesis 11, you have the Tower of Babel, and then right after the Tower of Babel, the author gives us the genealogy from Shem to Abram to show the connection between Shem and Abram, right? And then right after that genealogy, you have the three promises being given to Abram. So the author seems to be indicating that the three promises given to Abram are meant to be the solution to the problem at the Tower of Babel. There's a direct connection between the two. Clue number two. Notice how God tells Abraham, or Abram here, that all the families of the earth will be what? Blessed. Now, if we're paying very close attention, according to the narrative thread, what would that, all the families of the earth, what would that call to mind? Well, the previous event was the families of the earth being scattered, right? And the families of the earth bringing upon themselves the curse of exile, the curse of dispersion, the curse of division because of their sin in trying to make a name for themselves and rejecting God's covenant plan, etc., right? And so you have in that event the families of the earth bringing curse upon themselves and immediately following God makes a promise that through Abram all the families of the earth will be blessed. So you have a blessing being promised in response to the curse that the families of the earth brought upon themselves because of their wickedness and their infidelity at the Tower of Babel. Does that make sense? So once again, we see this connection. And finally, the last clue that seems to connect the three promises to the Tower of Babel is that God tells Abraham, Abram that he will make him make a what? A great name for Abram. Does that ring a bell for you? What did Nimrod say? Why did Nimrod initiate Tower Babel Project? So that we can make a name for ourselves. Note the illusion, the repetition. In the previous event of the narrative, Nimrod and those following him were trying to make a great name for themselves. And then here we have Abram, and God says, Abram, I'm going to make a great name for you. The author is trying to lead us, the reader, to make the connection that the promises made to Abraham is God's rescue plan. It is his plan of salvation. It is the solution to the problem that we encountered at the Tower of Babel. Interesting, huh? Those clues and those details. Uh, the next economic significance is that not only do the three promises given to Abram serve to be a solution to the problem at the Tower of Babel, but they also serve to be a solution to the problem in the garden with the original sin by Adam and Eve, right? Note, God tells Abram, all the families of the earth will be blessed, right? All of humanity will be blessed. Well, what did Adam and Eve do? <laughs> what did Adam and Eve do for humanity in the garden? They cursed all of humanity. And so that problem will be rectified through Abraham. Abram. I keep wanting to say Abraham. Boy, I just can't get myself with the Abram. And so we see a direct connection there. So you see the continuity of the narrative thread of the Father's plan of salvation. What God is doing with Abraham... 
fits within the divine drama. It makes sense when seen in light of what has gone before it. It has a place in history in going all the way back to Adam and Eve. There is purpose and there is meaning in these events that God is uh, participating in with Abram here. Third economic significance. Now check this out. These three promises serve to be the outline, so to speak, for the rest of salvation history. These three promises are the outline for the next three major covenants in salvation history. The covenant with Moses, the covenant with David, and the covenant with Jesus, which will consist of the remaining three lessons of this seminar. So take a look there. The first promise, remember, Abraham, your descendants will be a nation possessing a land. When is that promise fulfilled? It's fulfilled when the Israelites become a nation under the leadership of Moses at Mount Sinai in Exodus. Exodus chapter 19. What we read in verse 5 through 6, listen to this, quote, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, God says to the Israelites, you shall be my own possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, a holy nation, a holy nation. You see that? These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel, In quote. That's Exodus 19, verses 5 through 6 at Mount Sinai when God is entering into another covenant with the Israelites and saying, you are my holy nation, you see? So there's the fulfillment of the first promise. That's next week's lesson, the Mosaic covenant. The second promise of a dynastic kingdom, right? It's fulfilled when Israel becomes a kingdom with King Saul, their very first king in 1 Samuel chapters 8 through 9, the whole story there. But what's interesting is that Although they become a kingdom under King Saul, God does not renew the covenant until he brings it forth and rises up David. Because God deposes Saul of his kingship because of his wickedness. And God doesn't renew the covenant with Saul, but he will renew the covenant with David. And that'll be lesson six. That is the Davidic covenant. And then finally, the third promise, obviously, is ultimately fulfilled in the new and everlasting covenant of Jesus Christ. Where Jesus establishes his universal and everlasting kingdom in which all nations can exist and be a part of and consequently all the families of the earth be blessed through the grace of Jesus Christ that he wins for us on the cross, you see? So these three promises serve to be the outline for the next three major covenants of all of salvation history. So these three promises, needless to say, are very, very important. <laughs> As I mentioned at the outset, it's sort of the foundation, it's the bedrock for the rest of the divine story of salvation. Okay, so that concludes our reflection on the three promises promises there in Genesis 12 and sort of seeing their spread and their scope for the rest of salvation history. Now, I'd like for us to take a few moments to reflect upon Abraham, or Abram in this case, Abram's encounter with the mysterious figure Melchizedek in Genesis chapter 14. I just want to go through a few details, highlight a few things for you, and try to draw out their significance. First detail is the meaning of his name. Melchizedek is actually not his personal name. It's simply a title, kind of like a throne title, and it simply means king of righteousness. For example, our Pope, right? What is his title, per se? Pope Benedict XVI, right? That's his new name. It's sort of like a throne title. His real name is Joseph, Cor Joseph Ratzinger. But when he's elevated to the throne of Peter, right? In the office of the Bishop of Rome, he takes upon this throne title, so to speak, Benedict XVI. Similarly, Melchizedek is a throne title for this particular individual man. It means king of righteousness, which leads us to our next detail. This individual is a king. And he's not just a king of any place. He's the king of Salem 
which, my dear friends, eventually becomes known as Jerusalem. You see? And you can check out Psalm 76, verse 2, for the biblical reference of that. Jerusalem is the very place where this mis mysterious king was the king of. And that's going to be very important because you got this king of righteousness who is the king of Jerusalem. You see? <laughs> Uh, yeah, Jerusalem is, is um, Salam coming, it often refers to peace. It's like the city of peace. But Jerusalem is the city of Salem. Correct, it's the same place. Uh, detail number three. Not only is Melchizedek a king, but he's also a priest. He is a priest of the Most High God. Most High God. The Bible actually tells us this in Genesis chapter 14. He's a priest of the Most High God. But the other clue that leads us to conclude that he's a priest is because he offers a sacrifice. And in particular, he offers an unbloody sacrifice. A sacrifice of bread and wine, which was an offering of thanksgiving. Melchizedek, as priest, offers this sacrifice of bread and wine in thanksgiving for the victory that Abram had and wiping out I think five different kings to rescue his nephew Lot. And here is this king of Salem who's offering a sacrifice of thanksgiving and the Jewish tradition is called the Todah sacrifice because the Hebrew word for thanksgiving is Todah. The Greek equivalent is Eucharistia. You see? From which we get the English word what? Eucharist. It means thanksgiving. So in essence, this king of Jerusalem, Salem, is offering a sacrifice, a Eucharist sacrifice. Hint, hint. You see where we might be going with this, right? The economic significance of this is that it foreshadows, obviously, Jesus Christ, who is a king, right? Amen? King of kings, Lord of lords. He is also a priest, the Bible tells us, after the order of who? Melchizedek. And he's offering bread and wine, giving what? Thanks. Eucharistia in Greek, Toda in Hebrew. Where is he giving thanks, offering bread and wine? As king of Jerusalem and, and priest of the Most High God. In Jerusalem, right? So as Melchizedek, who is the king of Jerusalem, offers bread and wine, giving thanks to God, so to Jesus, the priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, the king of kings, offers bread and wine in thanksgiving to the Father in Jerusalem. You see? Yes, question. Go ahead. Where is it? Where part of the world is this in? Well, it's what, Jerusalem, where it is now. In Jerusalem proper. Yes, where Jerusalem is today, that, that is... I mean, obviously there's the new Jerusalem that's built because the old city was burnt down, etc. But it's in the same area. That old city of Jerusalem is the city that Melchizedek was king of. Okay? Now, um, somebody might ask the question, well, okay, well, wait a minute, Carlo. The Bible's saying he's a priest, right? Well, what priesthood is he a priest of? Because the only priesthoods that most people are familiar with in the Old Testament are the Aaronic and Levitical priesthood, right? Those descendants from the tribe of Levi, which was Moses and Aaron themselves, and then Aaron's sons were the high priests, and then all of the Levites ministered as priests. But this is before the Levitical and Aaronical priesthood. It, you know, Aaron wasn't constituted as a priest until Exodus 28. The Levitical priesthood didn't come into existence until Exodus 32 in the Golden Calf incident at Mount Sinai. Here's Melchizedek all the way back in Genesis 14, and he's a priest. What priesthood does he belong to? The Adamic priesthood. That is the natural priesthood of the fathers and the firstborn. You see? Remember we said in Lesson 1 that the author is communicating to us in the creation account that Adam is a priest to serve in the macro temple of the cosmos. And so that constituted the natural priesthood. Abel and Cain offer sacrifices, signifying that they are priests, right? And then you have Seth coming. And then Noah, who is the righteous descendant of Seth in the divine drama. Noah offers sacrifice, right? So that signifies he's a priest, etc. And so you have this natural priesthood of the fathers and the firstborn. So it is to this priesthood that Melchizedek belongs in offering the sacrifice of bread and wine. 
Now, another interesting detail in this event of the encounter between Abram and Melchizedek is that Abram recognizes Melchizedek as his superior. And keep in mind, this is the man who just wiped out five different kings and his arm and their armies to save his nephew Lot. And now here is Abram, the mighty valiant victor, giving tithes to this king of Salem, this king of righteousness of Melchizedek. And to give tithes to another, another is a sign of recognition of superiority in the other. In the Jewish tradition, the Israelites were to give tithes to the Levitical priest. Here you have Abram giving tithes to Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God. So Abram recognizes him as his superior, which is very interesting. Because the narrative is all about who? Abram! <laughs> it's all about Abram. God just made the promises to him that all the world will be blessed through him. And here's Abram giving tithes to Melchizedek. The next detail is that Melchizedek is seen as a messianic figure. Because in Psalm 110 verse 4, which in the Jewish tradition was understood to be a messianic psalm, in its literal historical context as referencing the son of David, Solomon, but the Jews understood that the great anointed one, the Mas uh, Mashiach, the Messiah, the Christos, there would be one, the anointed one, anointed by the Holy Spirit, who would be of the line of David, right? And so in Psalm 110, we discover David speaking of his son, Solomon, that Solomon will be a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So we see Melchizedek popping up in Psalm 110 in reference to the son of David. When the Jewish tradition, the great anointed one, the great Mashiach, the one anointed by the Holy Spirit, would be a son of David. So it was understood that the Messiah would be a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So you see the economic significance of this Melchizedek here in this event. He is pointing forward to the anointed one, the Mashiach, the Messiah, the Christos. And we know that Christos to be who? Jesus. Um, sixth detail. The identity of Melchizedek is speculated among scholars. And many scholars conclude that it is possible. There are very good scholarly reasons to believe that Melchizedek, which remember is a throne title, right, is actually Shem, the righteous firstborn son of Noah. Okay, and so what are the clues that would suggest such an interpretation? Well, the first clue is that, recall how I mentioned earlier, the author gives us, in order to introduce Abram and the narrative with Abram, he gives us the genealogy from Shem to Abram, right? Well, in the genealogy, the ge genealogy reveals that Shem lived long enough in order that he could very well be alive at the time of Abram. Now, that's taken into consideration that we would take the 600 and something years on a literal level, right? But according to the narrative, the number of years that the author tells us Shem lives, it's possible he could still be alive. He would be alive at the time Abram comes on the scene. So, it's in light of that, scholars conclude it's possible that this Melchizedek might very well be Shem. Now, the second clue, notice Melchizedek gives the blessing to Abram. He blesses Abram. Well, who is the last one in the narrative to receive the blessing? The blessing is a very significant uh, motif or theme all throughout salvation history and in biblical theology where the covenantal blessing is being passed on of God continuing his covenantal relationship with those for whom the blessing is given, right? So who is the previous one to receive the blessing? Shem. He received the blessing from Noah. Remember, Noah cursed Ham's son from the incestuous relationship, Canaan. But Noah specifically and explicitly blesses Shem. And so the last one in the narrative to receive the blessing is Shem. Now we come to Melchizedek and he's giving the blessing. 
you see? Which would point to the fact that Melchizedek may very well be Shem. Third clue, he's called the king of righteousness. Who was the last righteous individual in the narrative? Shem, in contrast to Ham and his descendants. And so there's another clue pointing to the identity of Melchizedek being Shem. And finally, he's of the firstborn priesthood. We just mentioned he's a priest of the Most High God. What priesthood is that? The natural priesthood, the priesthood of the fathers and the firstborn. Well, who was the last firstborn priest in the narrative? Shem. He was the firstborn son of Noah. So in light of these clues and many others, scholars offer and suggest the interpretation that this Melchizedek, priest of the Most High God, King of Salem, is actually Shem the righteous son of Noah, which fits within this divine drama, right, of the author focusing on Shem and Ham and contrasting those two and then showing us the narrative thread picking up with this righteous descendant of Shem, Abram, and how Shem is communicating the blessing of the covenantal relationship with God the Father. And so once again, we go back in the, in the narrative. We have Adam and Eve. Then we have the righteous son of Adam and Eve, Seth. And then from Seth, we have the covenantal blessing and the relationship with the father continuing with Noah and then Shem and then now Abram. So this is how it fits within the narrative thread. Okay, so that concludes our reflection on this encounter with Melchizedek. Now let's move to where the first promise of nation, land, is elevated to the status of a covenant, and that is in Genesis chapter 15. Uh, the first detail to make note of is the actual oath that God swears there in Genesis chapter 15, particularly verses 5 and 7, I'm going to extract here. Remember, uh, there are various covenantal features, various features whenever a covenant is made. One of those features is a sacred oath. Well, here's the oath that God swears here to Abram. We read Genesis 15, 5, quote, And he brought him outside, that is, God brings Abram outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall be your descendants, or so, so shall your descendants be. I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. To your descendants I give this land, end quote. And the land that he is referring, referring to, I'm sure we know is the land of Canaan. So this is where God is swearing the oath. Now, the f one thing to note here, uh, some scholars point out that uh, this oath seems to be within the narrative context a response to Abram's lack of faith or a complaint. In Genesis chapter 15 verse 3, which comes right before the oath, we read Abram saying, Behold, thou hast given me no offspring, Lord. Right? God, you told me way back when in Genesis 12 that, you know, I would have uh, descendants that would be a multitude. I would have many descendants and I still I ain't got no children. <laughs> so where's the promise? So Abram seems to be complaining, right? And, and challenging God's promise and fidelity. And it is in response to that complaint or that lack of faith that God swears the oath and says, okay, Abram, you don't trust me? Well, I'm going to swear an oath with you. I'm going to prove to you that I will be faithful to my promises and I'm going to make a sacred oath. Now, what's interesting here is that normally when we read this account of the dialogue between God and Abram, we think that it's happening at night, right? Because God said, uh, look toward heaven and number the stars. So in our imagination, we often think that, you know, Abram's in the night in this beautiful starry sky and no lights out there in the country fields and can see, and like, wow, that's a lot of children, God. <laughs> you know, that's a lot of descendants. But as scholars point out, there is a hint in the narrative that suggests it was not at night when God was talking to Abram, but it was in broad daylight. And the clue lies in Genesis 15, verse 12, okay? So in Genesis 15, 5 and 7, God swears the oath about having descendants as numbering the stores, as numerous as the stores. But then in verse 12, here's what we read. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. What does that imply? 
Well, if the sun's going down in verse 12, well then apparently it was up in verse 5 and 7 when God made the oath. And so the interpretive application, my dear friends, is that Abram must have faith even though he cannot see the stars. God takes him out in broad daylight and says, look to the heaven and number the stars. That's how many descendants you're going to have. God, I can't see the stars. Precisely the point. You've got to have faith without sight. You think you're without sight? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. And what does that remind you of? Point fast forward to the New Testament. Who says that? St. Paul, remember? I think it's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, if I'm not mistaken. You might want to check me out on that if you've got a Bible. 5, verse 7 through 8. St. Paul says, we walk by faith, not by sight. That's a motif that's found in the story of Abram. Isn't that a beautiful detail there? I tell you what, when I first found that out, Dr. Brent, I learned that from Dr. Brent Petrie in his lectures on the Old Testament, and I was just blown away. I was floored uh, when I discovered that, and also uh, my graduate professor, Dr. Timothy Gray, in his uh, scriptural classes that I took with the Augusta an institute. So an amazing detail there. Now the next detail is the faith of Abram. Uh, it's important to point out. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I might have missed that slide there. My apologies for that. We move to detail number two and that is the faith of Abram which is very important. Genesis chapter 15. I have verse 8 there on your handout but it's verse 6. We read and he believed the Lord and he, God reckoned it to him as righteousness. So it's important to highlight that although we found in verse 3 Three, Abram was complaining a little bit, lacking faith, but now God's actually going to bless him because despite his complaining, Abram does have faith and consequently God constitutes him in a state of justice, bringing Abram into a right relationship with him. We call that justification, right? Because of his faith. St. Paul is going to hammer this home in the book of Romans over and over again, particularly Romans chapter 4. St. Paul constantly refers to the faith of Abraham. Abraham was justified by faith because St. Paul is responding to those Jewish converts to Christianity who were saying, hey guys, in order to be saved, in order to be justified, you got to hold fast to the Levitical law. You still got to go to temple and offer the sacrifices. You still got to get circumcised to be saved, right? Well, St. Paul's argument in all of his epistles, particularly Romans, is like, is the following. Hey guys, guess what? Abram was justified by faith way before all of those ceremonial precepts came along with the Levitical law. You get it? And so that justification is by faith in Jesus Christ. So Jesus is taking us back to the time of Abram when he was justified by faith. And this is why it's important to highlight the faith of Abram in order to see the economic significance, right? The significance in salvation history and it makes a whole lot more sense now when you understand this historical backdrop when you start reading St. Paul. St. Paul makes a lot more sense when you can understand this continuity. Detail number three, the covenant sacrifice. Once again, another covenantal feature. We have the sacred oath in Genesis 15, 5 through 7. Now we come to the covenantal sacrifice in verses 9 through 10, and then verses 17 through 18. Here's what we discover. Quote, he said to him, bring me a heifer, God says, a heifer three years old, a she-goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in two, and laid each half over against the other. Then in verse 17, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. And that's representing God, God's presence, right? God is passing between the two pieces. Verse 18, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your descendants, I give this land. What is that called to mind? The first promise. The promise of land and nation. This is where God is elevating it to a covenant. He swore the sacred oath and now he's making the sacrifice. So a few things to note here. 
The first thing to note is uh, it seems to be once again a response to Abram's lack of faith and a question that we find in Genesis chapter 15 verse 8. Abram said, O oh Lord God, how am I to know that I will possess the land? Okay, in Genesis 15, 8, Abram's questioning God, right? Lack of faith? I don't know. But a question, indeed. And so in order to answer the question, God's going to seal it for Abram and say, okay, now I'm going to make the sacrifice for you. So uh, in verse 3, Abram says, uh, you haven't given me any offspring yet, God. And so God swears the sacred oath. And then Abram says, how am I going to know I'm going to possess the land, God? What does God do? He inaugurates, initiates the sacrifice, the covenant sacrifice, in order to further seal the deal, right? So, the next thing to note is what's the big deal about, what's the business, this business of splitting the animals in two, right? And having these two pieces of the animal and, and God passing through the two halves of the split open animal. I mean, this is pretty graphic, right? Well, it makes perfect sense when you understand the historical background. And the historical background was that this was a covenant-making ritual. This was a ritual that was common in all covenant-making ceremonies. The animal that was offered in sacrifice for the covenant would be cut in half, and the parties of the covenant would walk through the two halves. Why? Because it was a visible gesture of saying... May what happened to this animal happen to me if I am unfaithful to the terms of the covenant. You see? And so it's actually um, swearing upon themselves the curse of the covenant. Every covenant has a blessing and a curse. Blessing for fidelity, curse for infidelity. And the parties would walk through the two halves of the animals in order to signify, may this curse come upon me if I am unfaithful to the covenant. And so, in the narrative, who walks through the two halves? God does. And so, in essence, God is taking the curse of the covenant upon himself and binding himself to the covenant and to the promise and the oath he's making to Abram. Now, what's the significance of this? Hmm. God taking the curse of the covenant upon himself. My dear friends, this foreshadows Jesus Christ, whom St. Paul says he takes the curse of sin upon himself. The curse of, the, of infidelity to the covenant with God is death. That's one of the curses. And so Jesus takes the curse of the covenant, death, because Israel was unfaithful to their Messiah by rejecting him. And so he takes the curse of the covenant, death, upon himself in order to set Israel free from that curse. And that event of Jesus taking the curse of sin upon himself is prefigured all the way back here in the Abrahamic covenant when God Yahweh Almighty passes through the two halves of the animals taking the curse of the covenant upon himself. Another detail that's important to highlight is God's prophecy about the 400 year exile. We read in Genesis chapter 15 verses 12 through 16, right after God made the sacred oath about having descendants as numerous as the stars and the sacred oath about, hey, Abram, I'm making this sacrifice to seal the deal. You're going to possess the land. Here's what God says. Then the Lord said to Abram, know of a surety that your descendants will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs. Wait a minute. That's exile. And will be slaves there and they will be oppressed for 400 years but I will bring judgment on the nation which they serve and afterward they shall come out with great possessions in quote what 400 year slavery is God referring to fast forwarding and fast forwarding in the narrative the Egypt the slavery in Egypt and God brought judgment on that nation right so God's prophesying about that 400 year slavery where Abram's descendants will be exiled out of the very land that God promised to give to him, right? So the logical question is, well, wait a minute, God just promised him the land, now he's telling him he's going to take it away from him and exile his descendants out of the land? What's the rationale? Well, some scholars suggest 
that the possible rationale behind this is due to Abram's question. How shall I know I will possess it? You see? And scholars point out that it is after that question in Genesis chapter 15 verse 8 and following that you have God making the covenant, the sacrifice but then God prophesies about the exile and the slavery. So there seems to be a correlation between Abram's questioning how shall I know I'm going to possess it God and then the prophecy of the exile. So the interpretive application is that there must have been some lack of faith on Abram's part in God's sacred oath that he would have the descendants and he would have the land. And because of that lack of faith, there will be consequences wrought upon his descendants, namely 400 years in slavery. You might, you might think that's a bit harsh, right? And you might think, well, man, this, it seems like he's just asking a question. Well, my dear friends, very often there's nothing wrong with questioning when you question for instruction with faith. But what we do find throughout Scripture, scripture is sometimes questions are asked motivated by a lack of faith, right? And doubt. Let me fast forward just as an aside. Go to the uh, Gen uh, excuse me, Luke chapter 1. Remember the story of Zechariah? Angel Gabriel appears to Zechariah offering incense in the temple and says, Hey, Zechariah, your barren wife, Elizabeth, is going to conceive a child. What, Lord? How's that going to happen? What happens to Zechariah? Zip! <laughs> He's mute, right? Until John the Baptist is born. Well, he just asked a question. Well, the narrative tells us that the narrative hints to the disposition of Zechariah, that he was lacking in faith. There was a, a, an element of doubt there in God's plan, right? Now, later on in Luke chapter 1, at the Annunciation, the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and says, Hey, Mary, you're going to conceive a child. What does Mary say? How shall this be? Actually, she doesn't. She says, How shall this be? She asked a question. But is she zipped up and mute? No. So the narrative tells us and hints to the fact that Mary's question was free of doubt, but with faith. And so we come back to Abram. He asked this seemingly innocent question, how, shall, how am I going to know, God, that I'm going to possess it? And then the prophecy of the 400-year exile and slavery. So it hints to something on the disposition of Abram. He was lacking in faith to some degree, and consequently... There's a curse of exile. Uh, and finally, the last detail I'll highlight for you is Abram's deep sleep in Genesis chapter 15, verse 12. In the narrative thread of things, in the narrative context, who was the last one to fall into a deep sleep? Adam. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 21, we read, So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. So what's the interpretive application? Abram is a new Adam. Okay? Now, despite this lack of faith, there is still a revelation of Abram as a new Adam. Just like Noah, remember? Noah was a new Adam. The narrative suggested those clues and offered us those clues to make that suggestion. The same is true for Abram. And so, uh, that's the covenantal event of, uh, the, for the first promise, of ele elevating the first promise of nation and land to the status of a covenant. So... Let's go ahead and go on to the second promise. The second promise is covenanted in Genesis chapter 17, and that is the promise of a dy dynastic kingdom, that Abram's name would be great, and that he would therefore have a great dynasty. Uh, the first detail worthy of highlight is Abram's age. At this particular point in the story of Genesis 17, he's at the age of 99. When he received the promise of a great name and the dynasty in Genesis 17, he was 75. So that's 20, it's been 24 years since that promise of a great dynasty and many descendants, right? And guess what? Abram still ain't got no child, okay? And so you can sense, you know, the weight of what Abram would have been feeling here in regard to trying to be faithful to God's promises. 
The second detail, uh, we find the first covenantal feature, and that is the sacred oath. In Genesis 17, 2 through 3, we read, God, will, uh, God says, I will make my covenant between me and you. So note that term, covenant. In Genesis 15, God spoke of a covenant there. Now he's speaking of another covenant. Okay, I, I will make a covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. Kings shall come forth from you. So scholars zero in and see the dynastic promise being covenanted, so to speak, here in Genesis 17. Now, you may ask the question, well, why another covenant when God just made one with Abram in Genesis chapter 15? Why another covenant? Well, possible reason for this next covenant the many, uh, um, another covenant with the same man, Abram, right? Is Abram's sin with Hagar. And what's our clues? Well, Genesis 17, where God is making this covenant of a dynastic kingdom, right? Comes after Genesis 16. What happened in Genesis 16? Abram lacks faith and lacks trust in God's promise of having his offspring and takes uh, the, con the maidservant Hagar of Sarah there. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> um, yeah, Sarah. Yeah, I was thinking uh, Isaac <laughs> and uh, Rachel and stuff. So I was getting my stories mixed up. But, and so Abram takes uh, the maidservant of Sarah, Hagar, right? And conceives Ishmael. Well, that's in Genesis 16. And then here in Genesis 17, we have this renewal of a covenant. So scholars see that it's possible that God has to renew the covenant with Abraham, or Abram in this case, because of his sin with Hagar in Genesis 16. And the next clue is found in Genesis 17, 1. God says, walk before me, Abram, and be blameless. Well, why would God have to tell Abram to be blameless unless he did something that was blameful, you see? So it's possible that the blameful action, his sin with Hagar in Genesis 16, is the reason why God has to tell Abram, walk blameless before me and I'm renewing this covenant with you. And we're, we're going to see this connection even further in a few moments when we get to circumcision, okay? And seeing the connection between this covenant in Genesis 17 as a response to Abram's sin with Hagar in Genesis 16. Uh, detail number three, note the change of Abram's name to Abraham in Genesis 17.5. Abram simply meant exalted father. Abraham means father of multitudes or nations, right? But note the irony of that. Can you imagine Abram? God's given him a new name. Hey, Abram, you're now not just exalted father, and you still ain't got a child, but now I'm going to call you father of multitudes. And guess what? He ain't got no children. <laughs> Could you imagine walking, Abram walking around, you know, and now his name's Abraham. Hey, father of multitudes. He ain't even got any children. And, and that would be very significant in the ancient world because you were what your name was. You know, your name signified your very essence. So for Abram to get this name, father of multitudes, and yet not have any children, it's a cause of strife and a cross to carry for Abram. So we can kind of sense the dilemma that he would have been experiencing and wrestling with in this relationship with God. Now, we've looked at the covenant oath and this changing of the name, which is very significant. Now we look at the covenant sign, and that is circumcision. In Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 14 is the whole narrative, but I want to highlight verse 10 through 12. This is my covenant, God says, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He that is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, In quote. So the sign of this covenant between God and Abram is going to be, Abraham now, now I can start saying Abraham, is circumcision. Interesting, right? Why this sign? 
I mean, why the generative organs, right? Well, a few possible reasons here. Number one, the first possible reason is that the gener generative organs are tied to family, right? Procreation, which points to covenants. What does a covenant make? Family bonds. And so God makes the sign of the covenant with Abram and puts it in the very flesh of the generative organs to symbolize the family kinship that is established with covenants. That's a possible reason. Secondly, sexual intercourse and reproduction will always serve to be a sign and a reminder for Abram and his, and his descendants of the covenant that God makes with Abram and that his descendants will be multiplied. So every time sexual intercourse is engaged, there's the sign. There's the reminder. God made the sacred oath to Abram that his descendants would be multiplied and he would bless the whole human family, right? That's a possible reason. And then the third possible reason, which I find to be very profound, is that it is a punitive consequence for Abram's sin of the flesh in taking Hagar and lacking in trust of God's promise there in Genesis 16. And this further supports the connection between the covenant being made in Genesis 17 and Abram's sin with Hagar in Genesis 16. In other words, it is a punitive punishment. It is a punishment, right? So the sign of the covenant is actually a punishment. Um, that is to say, hey, Abram, you failed to trust my promises and you took Hagar and committed a sin of the flesh. And so from now on, for the rest of salvation history, you're going to remember that sin. And I'm going to embed it in the very flesh of the very area where the sin was committed, you see? And so it would be a constant reminder to Abram and all of his descendants, particularly to Abram, that if you are unfaithful to the covenant, you risk losing the sacred promises. You risk cutting off your descendants from the covenantal blessing. You see? So, uh, these are possible reasons for why circumcision is the sign of the covenant. So you might say, in light of this reason, the punishment fits the crime. <laughs> right? Okay? <laughs> so that's a possible reason. Now, granted, none of these are definitive interpretations. These are possible suggestions that scholars are offering in light of the narrative context. Now, the final thing I'll say about this particular covenant in Genesis 17 before we take our break is note the economic significance. And that is this sign of the covenant is actually a type and a foreshadowing of the sacrament of baptism. We have a new covenant concept being prefigured here in the act of circumcision. And St. Paul teaches us this. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 through 12, St. Paul teaches us that baptism is the fulfillment of circumcision. Quote, In him also you were circumcised, St. Paul talking about being in Christ, in him, Christ, you were circumcised with a circumcision made with out hands by putting off the body of flesh in the circumcision of Christ. And you were buried with him in what? Baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. End quote. So according to St. Paul, baptism is in the new covenant. It's the new circumcision. So baptism is in the New Covenant what circumcision was for the Old. What did circumcision do in the Old Covenant? It was the gateway, the entry into, the means by which one entered into the familial relationship with God and entered into the covenantal blessing. Well, in the New Covenant, it is through baptism, the new circumcision of Christ, by which one enters into the covenantal family of God in the new covenant. Does that make sense? So we see this typology going on here by looking at circumcision and then looking forward to baptism. Amen? Okay, so let's go ahead and take a break right now. When we come back, we'll pick up with Genesis chapter 22 where the third promise of universal blessing is elevated to the level of a covenant when you have the offering of Isaac. All right, God bless.